And as the days go by, there's not a cop who takes vacation. Anybody had a day off, they voluntarily, you understand this per personal, huh? This is not just a murder. This is a chief. Uh, this is the DA's old man who got murdered. Earl Warren now, of course, is getting reports. Things are getting hot on the streets for the usual suspects. I know what I mean by that is parolers, people with criminal histories, and of course informants who stay out of prison and jail by telling the cops what's up. And there's a lot of those. And as the days go by, and as the cops and, and DA investigators and Oakland PD and FBI and everybody starts leaning on people to get this guy's killer, the father's killer, he, everybody comes into his office 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The chief wants to talk to us. All right. But he's probably pissed off leads. He says, come on in, have a seat. And then, as they're expecting to be chewed out, and my father's killer, he says, I'm getting a lot of trouble for me. We're close, Chief. Don't worry. We're, all, we're almost there. We, we've got three good suspects. He says, no. What troubles me is tactics out there on the street. You're breaking people's rights. He says, I want you to catch my father's killer. And I want you to do it the right way. And they all kind of now look at each other. You know, well, he has to say that, right? He has to say that, right? He says, you don't get it. I want you to get evidence so we can convict my father's killers. But you have to get evidence we can use. I don't want you taking shortcuts around the Constitution to catch even my father's killers. They said, uh, sounds like he means it. Okay. Uh, we'll have him for you soon. He breaks up. Now the word goes on the street. Be careful what you're doing out here. The boss doesn't want us to hurt anybody's feelings. <laughs> While we're doing this, be nice. Being nice, or a warrant meant was be lawful. And to this day, it remains a cold case. We never did catch his father's killer or killers. The word was they were about this close to two or three guys, and all they needed to do was lean a little bit harder, and they were doing that. And they were with career criminals, and they're used to it. They're hard to break. But the ones they thought did the crime, and the ones they were told who did it by their informants on the street, they had to back off a little bit as lawyers now started to get into the picture. And because they had to back off and stop twisting people's arms and stop breaking the rules of the Constitution, things went cold. <coughs> people shut up. People who were afraid that they would be leaned on Stop being afraid because the DA himself said don't lean on him like that. Considerations from the man himself who lost his father. They never did solve that case. Now I've mentioned all of this to you because although the politics of Earl Warren and my politics would differ markedly, I can tell you one thing about that man. He was an honest and a man of principle. That guy was true to his beliefs. He really believed in this thing called due process of law. Even when this old man was brutally and horribly murdered in his kitchen, he still made sure his investigators knew to do it right. I wouldn't have been that honorable, I guarantee you. I guarantee you. But that man, who then later would become governor of California, he would be chairman of the Republican Party. He was a conservative Republican. And then eventually, after Eisenhower, Republican, got uh, elected president, all the favors that this Republican guy did for, to get him elected, he got his payoff. You understand political favor? And when Eisenhower said to the chairman of the political uh, Republican Party, who got Eisenhower elected, Earl Warren, okay, what do you want? He said, I'd like to go to that court. He said, done. And so a Republican conservative president, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, appoints his conservative Republican friend, who got him elected, got all them votes in. And he goes on the court as Chief Justice in 1953-54. And the first case, of course, 
that comes across their desk, the great big one, 1954, was Brown versus Board of Education. A major, one could say the major civil rights case where separate but equal educational facilities were declared by the court to be not equal. Earl Warren was a great persuader. And for that case, Brown versus Board of Education, he convinced the other eight justices, some were liberal, some were conservative, like himself. He says, whichever way we decide on this case, he says, we had better say it with one voice. You understand why you would say such a thing? This was big. This was black and white. And it's going to be one way or the other, he said. We can't have a split court on this because it wouldn't look good. And of course, we'd get all kinds of trouble and all kinds of criticism. And it will never be, well, he said, this is too important to be split 6-3 or 5-4. If we're going to go one way or the other, we've got to go with one voice. And then he said, and you know which way I want to go. He wanted to end the separate facilities for black and white children educational facilities that were not in any way equal to each other, but very much separate discrimination in schools and education. He says, you know how I want to go. And they all said, I must do And his first big, big notoriety came when they announced nine to nothing unanimously that separate educational facilities for black and white kids is not equal in any sense of the word. That would have to change. And then you could say it begins big time the civil rights movement, the African American uh, portion, of course, and that would, of course, encompass lots of other stuff as it would roll on. Now, from that day forward, his reputation with conservative America, particularly though the Democrats of the South, Southern Democrats, his name was Mud from that day on. He was the enemy. He had just pissed on the tabernacle. Sacrilege, blasphemy. And from that day on, it was an uphill battle for him against mostly the people who wanted him in as Chief Justice, his conservative brethren. 1965, in Griswold versus Connecticut, you see another example of judicial review from a court known as the Chief Warren, Warren Court, Chief Justice Earl Warren, and he gives the opinion to be written to his most liberal justice on the court, William Douglas. His nickname was the Lion of the Left. If there's any doubt if he was liberal, that was his nickname, the Lion of the Left. Very liberal man. A very interesting man. I recommend to you, if you're ever going to read any biographies about these U.S. Supreme Court justices, to learn so much about our country and our history and, and law and society and everything. You can read any biography on William Douglas, William O. Period Douglas, or Hugo Black, my favorite. When William Douglas sits down to write this opinion, he already knows what he wants to say. Because he's been chomping at the bit like a wild horse to this date. So, as you know the background, you read the case, you have a law in Connecticut that makes it illegal and makes it a crime for Planned Parenthood doctor and administrator to give information to be used for contraception. Got that? You say, well, that was against the law? Yeah, it was. Now, you're talking about abortion here. We're talking about preventing conception by pills and intrauterine device and other ways. So when it gets to the U.S. Supreme Court, because these two people were found guilty in the Connecticut court, they appealed in Connecticut, and Connecticut said, this is our law, and you got no appeal here. The U.S. Supreme Court says, eh, we'd like to take a look at this. Up until this case, 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut, privacy had always been described and defined in terms of property. 
And the more property you own, the more privacy you have. No man shall set foot upon my property but you trespass. That's what the sign says. That's privacy, you see. Prior to this, the U.S. Supreme Court had upheld many times some very notable cases that we're not going to do in here, but many times they had said that Americans have privacy of their home, of their papers and effects, their property, their things, and the government can, can't just take it without real good reason and things like warrants. But never was personal privacy ever mentioned like personal privacy. And here it is for the first time, 1965. 